Welcome to Strathclyde University in the heart of Glasgow's Innovation District. My name is Alison Culpin. I'm the Director for Scotland for ABPI. I'm delighted to have you here with us today and thank you very much for, for coming in live. Uh, we're going to have our inaugural Global Showcase which will hopefully give you an insight into work that's going on in Scotland that we think is groundbreaking. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. You can do so throughout the, um, the presentations and they'll be taken at the end of the presentations. Uh, also, those presenting will have the, their direct details forwarded to you tomorrow along with the presentations and we will get that organised. It'll be tomorrow afternoon. So thank you very much for coming along. You aren't here to listen to me, so I'm just going to hand over now to Dr. George Crooks. Are you Professor George Crooks now? Professor, George. Professor so uh, the man has earned the title, so let's not take it away. Uh, <laughs> Professor George Crooks, um, who's going to discuss uh, the data work that he's been doing uh, of late. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. What I want to do is divide my talk into two component parts. One is to advocate the use of digital technologies in health and care and remind all of you who are listening to this why this is fundamentally important both now and in the future and then talk about how we can leverage advantage uh, out of these technologies to generate meaningful data that will actually make a real difference to us as individuals not as individuals working within the health and care space, but us as individuals living our life on this planet. So it's all about an injection of reality. This is the vision for the NHS in Scotland uh, for 2020. And this vision is no different to actually most of the visions of every healthcare organization, be you a large HMO in the States, be you a region in Europe, uh, or even the aspirations in some of the developing countries uh, around the world that everyone is able to live longer, healthier lives at home. In Scotland, we're going to do that by integrating health and social care. We're going to focus on prevention, anticipation, and supported self-management. We recognise hospitals are expensive and dangerous places, and we want you to be in a hospital for as short a time as possible. And we want to get you home, or if we can't get you home, we'll care for you in a homely setting. There is no one who is listening to this who could object to anything in that statement. The reality, however, is that the Scottish Government recognised that we are not going to be able to deliver that vision by 2020 because none of our health and care systems, wherever you are in the world, is able to transform themselves quickly enough to meet that overly ambitious target. Most of you won't be aware of what that building is, but for those in Scotland, that is the newest hospital that we have in the UK. It's the Queen Elizabeth II Hospital in Glasgow. It cost over £1 billion to build and equip. And the question is, will it address the health and care problems that we have day to day here in Scotland? And the answer to that is, no, it will not. It won't make one iota of a difference for the vast majority of us, but what it has done it's lifted hospital and secondary care and tertiary care services out of Victorian buildings into a building that is fit for purpose, but it's really not going to impact our key health and societal challenges. Because this is where most of us live our lives. We live our lives in our communities, and more importantly, we want also to die in our communities. But the reality is the vast majority of people do not get their wish and die at home, surrounded by their families, they die in institutional care, and that needs to change. And my rationale for purporting uh, digital solutions is that digital solutions can actually help this problem. So this is familiar to everyone. Whether you're in Europe, the US, or even sub-Saharan Africa, the challenges are the same. We have got an aging society. There's an increase in long-term conditions. We are absolutely hopeless wherever you are in doing uh, health service workforce planning. Uh, we have, courtesy of the global credit crunch, still got financial challenges within health sectors 
uh, again globally. And this issue of health inequalities, there remains a significant difference between, in the ha between the haves and the haves nots. Um, and it's less now about how long you live on the planet, it's more about how many you, you, years you live uh, in a state of good health. And as I say, it's a global problem. Now, what I'm going to show you now are a couple of slides that relate to Scotland. Scotland's got a population of 5.3 million. I commissioned a piece of work looking at the projected prevalence of chronic diseases. You can see there the predictions for hypertension, diabetes, cardiac failure, and COPD. Uh, the reality, therefore, is that if we expect conventional long-term condition management services to deal with that increase in patient numbers between 2014 through to 2024, let alone to 2029, we are not going to have enough capacity to manage that. We need to do things differently. But I don't know what your experience is, but certainly as a senior manager within the NHS in Scotland, I sit around these tables where these matters are discussed. Everybody recognizes the problem. I don't hear many people coming up with the solutions. And it's not just one chronic condition that a person will have. As you get older, you amass long-term conditions the way you probably amass grandchildren. <laughs> this is a picture from the first day of the NHS in 1948 in the UK, and this will be the same again wherever you are listening to this presentation. The way we deliver health services, the vast majority of our health services, has not changed since the late 1940s, early 1950s. People go to see their doctor. People are sent to hospital. People come back uh, from the hospital, back to their family physician, and rattle backwards and forwards through different places in the system. I hope some of you uh, recognize this picture. When I show this to medical students, they have no idea what this is. This is a bank. Uh, this is a bank from 1962. Um, for those of you who are fashion conscious, you may be able to, to uh, recognize the late 1950s, early 1960s fashion. That is a bank. Uh, the young people of today don't recognize that because this is how we do most of our banking. That's a hospital waiting room in London in 1907. That is a hospital waiting room in London in 2016. Things have changed. Well, actually, not that much, much has changed. The lighting has changed, courtesy of Philips. Uh, the floor coverings have changed. The wall coverings have changed. The fashion has changed. But the way that services are delivered actually have not moved on significantly. We may be using your advanced pharmaceutical products within these systems, but the overarching system hasn't moved forward, and we kid ourselves on it has. So it's not simply about thinking digital, we need to move to a digital world, and why do we need to do that? Well, we need to do that because this uh, is what is happening in most senior management suites within health delivery organizations at the moment. The digital revolution is a bit like the car in the background. It will never catch on. It is noisy. It is unreliable. It's not trustworthy. So if we just invested by putting an extra two horses in the front and made the carriage a little bit bigger, we'll be able to cope for the next three to five years, is the argument that is still being rehearsed day in, day out. So let's get the facts. What environment does this? Increases mortality by 20%, increases length of stay, increases the likelihood of errors and litigation. It is emergency department overcrowding. Um, what are the challenges in most health and care systems around the world? It is this. People use hospital emergency departments as their default option uh, for health care, particularly if you're disadvantaged. So that is the reality. We take people from a dangerous environment in their community, we put them in a nice, clean ambulance, and then we drop them off in an even more dangerous environment, and we think we're doing a good job. But what environment does this? 15% reduction in A&E visits. You can read this slide as well as I can. The reality is, it is this. It's self-supported, technology-enabled care. The most unreliable person to record a blood pressure 
in the healthcare system anywhere in the world at the moment is a doctor. Statistically, doctors record blood pressures that ends in a five or a zero. The next most inaccurate person to record a blood pressure is a nurse. The most reliable person to record a blood pressure is the person themselves because they've got a vested interest in recording it correctly. And we know that self-administered hypertension management not only improves blood pressure recording, but actually increases adherence to medication. It is simple. But how many systems around the world have got self-monitoring uh, of hypertension as the core way they deliver hypertension management at this moment in time? Very, very, very few. So, if anybody tells you that using digital technologies is new and just be patient, it'll eventually come along. We have been producing evidence back into the late 1960s. There's over 11,000 publications, over 2,000 about chronic disease management, over 180 randomized controlled trials. The evidence is there, yet systems are still slow to adopt. My team led a multi-center European trial using digital technologies in the management of long-term conditions. And I'm not going to show you the clinical results. The clinical results speak for themselves. In fact, in all cases, it was either better or as good as conventional therapy. It was certainly no worse. But I just want to share you with this insight. It was particularly targeted at people over the age of 65. And what you see here is actually about half the people didn't have access to a computer or a laptop. Over 88%, it's now over 90%, had access to mobile phone technology. Non-participation rates in the COPD group and the cardiac failure group were absolutely consistent. About 25% of people declined using the, 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 the technologies because they were intimidated by technology. It was only 2% in the diabetic group. Why was the difference? The reason for that is that since the early 1970s, part of conventional management of diabetes is patient education. So a diabetic patient testing their own blood glucose with a blood glucose machine is not intimidating because it is part of the treatment pathway of conventional therapy. Yet we haven't looked at how we are supporting people to use technology. We think patients should be grateful that they're being given the offer of using technology. And then we balk at the idea that some of them will turn that down. It's not difficult. But when they use it, the satisfaction is something that some airlines, particularly the one based in the Republic of Ireland, uh, called Ryanair, for those who don't know, would absolutely be delighted to have. So if people use these technologies, they really like them and they want more of them. So what can digital technologies do? We asked the citizens of Scotland what was important to them and what did they want to do as far as looking after their own health and the health of the people they love, their families. People in Scotland, and I don't think it'll be different to anywhere in the world, want to give something back to their families. They want to care for others, but don't know how to do it. And sometimes they avoid giving care because they're scared they will do harm. They like the stories of resilience when there's torrential rain or there's heavy snowfall, how people will come out into the street and dig the street out for themselves and the neighbors. But they regret that that only happens for two to three weeks of the year. Uh, and then people go back into their day-to-day -day cocooned lives. They want there to be more of that. They want to share skills and experience with other, others, and they want to be better connected, better connected with their families at a distance, better connected to their communities. And everybody listening to this knows that technology does that because you are using that in your day-to-day -day lives. Your children and your grandchildren are using it in their day-to-day -day lives. Yet when you step into a health and care environment, you step back 10 to 15 years in your use of digital technologies. And the pharmaceutical industry is as guilty as anybody else because you are one of the most risk averse organizations that there is on this planet with good reason, but good reason only up to a point. So what does this tell you? 
It actually says to me, if we can unlock the creativity, skills, and experience that each of us as individuals have within our side ourself, inside ourselves, play to the willingness of communities to give back and unlock these things through the use of digital technologies, you can create an incredible environment. And for these things to happen, it's all about the power of data and the power of data flow. And it's about listening what's important to people, what's important to you, what's important to me, not what's important to the consultant looking after me or the healthcare organization that gives that person a roof over their head. And it's not about replacing the most rich resource that a health and care system has, which is face-to-face -face care. It's about making sure face-to-face -face care is available to those who need it, but to use every digital channel available to us when it is safe, appropriate, and effective to do so. And that's my challenge to you, is to you know your own environment. You actually do know about technology if you don't find out about it and determine how you can unlock that resource and mine it for the benefit uh, of uh, your communities going forward. But we need to keep it simple. So my organization tries to do that. We're an innovation center for digital health and care. And what we do is we identify health and care problems, the real problems that are there today. And then we look to see how innovation uh, can provide the greatest impact. In the past, there have been technologies presented to people, and it's about technology chasing a problem. We look at things the other way around. Where are the wicked problems where technology can help? And it's all about collaboration. It's bringing the citizens themselves, their carers together with academia, with industry, and with health and care delivery organizations to work together, because not one of us has the answer to these problems. And I think that's probably been the theme of all of the events that I've run through today. And that's what we do. We bring all the key players into one safe space. And what's interesting, it's no longer about product. It's more and more about services. And it's about services that are relevant to citizens. It's about person-centered care. It's about person-centered design. And it's all about services and service outcomes. It's never about technology. Because if you get the service redesign wrong, it doesn't matter how good your digital tool or technology is. It won't work. And the other thing, we need to recognize that we're all different. That's why you manufacturer, manufacture many different drugs to manage the same medical condition. Yet we often use one digital technology solution to address the needs of everyone with COPD or cardiac failure or asthma. And then we're surprised when a lot of people stop using the service after five minutes. They should be grateful for what they've got. Not at all. So this is the holy grail. It's about citizen-centered data sharing. And what we have done is that we have taken citizen-centered data sharing and we are turning that into a meaningful dialogue where no longer do we simply look at the management of hypertension from a health organization point of view, but we actually look at it from a personal perspective and look at a service model for the future that blends citizen-generated data with diagnostic and recognized health data to preserve, uh, to, to produce a rich picture of an individual and everything that impacts their lives. And I'll talk a little bit about how that can be of benefit as we move forward. So we have built here in uh, Glasgow in the University of Strathclyde a simulation and demonstration environment. The simulation environment um, is effectively uh, a, a, a piece of, of, of ICT architecture that has got three key component to it, components to it. It is a citizen-facing data exchange layer, and it has got an untethered personal data store. And untethered means it's not part of the formal NHS service, it's not owned by government, it's owned by you, the individual. And it's a completely GDPR environment. And the important thing to state about this is, 
We are designing this in a way that will hopefully complement um, what you're going to hear uh, just later on from a talk from, from Jeff Huggins and Alistair Hahn. But we are really looking at the citizen, the citizen side of things. How you can take citizen-generated data from their own devices, from sensors within their home, from smart meter data, and blend that in a way with rich data that comes from the health, formal health and care system to present a picture um, of a citizen to inform service planning and better informed decision making. And at the moment, we can take that data from your home, uh, we can take it into our exchange layer, providing it, it, it sits within agreed uh, uh, standards, um, and we can move that data uh, uh, in our environment so far into uh, uh, Scotland's largest uh, hospitals clinical portal and on either into the electronic health record or into the GP record and export data the other way. And that's built and available today. And we'll be looking to link in with um, the uh, National Digital Service uh, in the fullness of time and we're looking to build this in partnership with colleagues in the National Health Service to make sure that we have a a single structured opportunity for how we can take this forward. And this is interesting to the pharmaceutical industry because one of the challenges is that you invest a huge amount of money recruiting people into multi-center clinical trials and lots of patients drop out. And actually the formal um, disease monitoring that you do doesn't actually identify why people drop out the trial. And it's usually for reasons that are not directly related to the medicine itself. There's other reasons. If you were collecting citizen-generated data, you would have a much richer picture. And I know one pharmaceutical company has done that and has had gained significant insight into trial design to try to reduce the number of fallouts based on evidence that they've got. Soft evidence, which actually paints that rich picture. And then if you join data sets, and in Strathclyde, we're working with our academic colleagues to link uh, data from the education system, uh, from the criminal justice system, with citizen-generated data, and then with health data, you can actually stratify your populations in completely different ways to allow you to get ahead of the curve, to target interventions much more appropriately, to target uh, inputs that are meaningful, that might not necessarily be primarily health inputs, but may have a greater impact on the day-to-day -day life of citizens. So for us, it's all about the art of the possible. For me, it is about looking to collaborative partnership with colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry to determine how we can leverage and unlock the potential within citizens, within citizens' data, in a way that will better inform um, not simply product design and development, but this whole issue about seamless and low-cost post-marketing surveillance. And it's much better doing that using citizens' own devices, using devices they're using to manage their day-to-day -day lives, to manage their home, devices that actually are the route for utilities into their homes. By collecting that rich data set and mining it using machine learning and other uh, tools and services, you can mine a really rich seam of information that at the moment is completely untapped. So I just want to rush on to, to my final slide, and it's another one. Because everything I've said today is possible. It can be done today, but it cannot be done in isolation. It has to be done in collaboration, and it needs to put the patient, the person, citizens of this world at the centre of our thinking, both in planning but also in delivery. And an ideal time to hand over to my colleague, Professor Roman Maguire. A great opportunity uh, to talk to you today about some of the work that we're doing at the University of Strathclyde as part of the Digital Health and Wellness Group. Um, that's based within the Department of Computing and Information Sciences. And really just to point out here, as George says, this is very much a collaborative effort where we've worked with multiple stakeholders over the years to really start to think about how do we bring the patient, the citizen, at the heart of clinical decision making and how do we improve um, outcomes. 
bringing together the patient and technology to really think about how we do this in partnership. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is based on patient reported outcome measures. So these are self reports by the person and how they feel, be it their symptoms, their quality of life, their physical functioning. Um, and what we really welcome is the real focus on patient reported outcome measures, um, how lots of people are now interested in how you can bring the patient perspective into clinical decision making, how can you embed that within electronic platforms, and how can you optimise clinical decision making, bringing this patient self-report into the clinical decision making arena. And when you look at the growing body of evidence, so we started looking at uh, patient reported outcome measures over 10 years ago, we could see the value in having the patient, the citizen at the heart of the decision making process. And to us and to many people nowadays, as George alluded to, we see patient self-report as being the gold standard because they are the expert in their condition. They are the people living with the condition. They are the best people to rate how they feel and rate how their condition, their medicine, their treatment is impacting on them. And when you look at the growing body of evidence on patient reported outcome measures within the literature, we're seeing that there's an increased identification of patient concerns and that they feel more cared for in being asked about how they are and to report on that. Um, the ident identification of biopsychosocial issues that historically were traditionally overlooked, um, often within medical consultations. Importantly, the more timely reporting and management of symptoms less patient anxiety. So we know that anxiety is a huge driver to inappropriate service use, emergency admissions. If we can find ways that we can reduce that anxiety and make people feel safer, more cared for, it will actually have a huge impact on our health system as a whole. Importantly, greater satisfaction with care. That's what we want. Promotion of self-care. So we're looking at how in the UK and in Scotland and worldwide, we're looking at how we can shift the balance of care away from busy acute hospitals to community settings. And if you can look at ways that you can enable that self-care, you're looking at a vehicle to try and empower individuals to be more involved in the care and the management of their own conditions. And importantly, it's about com improved communication. Um, often when you look at the patient experience of different treatments, of different outcomes, communication is still a problem. But what we're seeing with the use of technology and the use of PROMS and remotely monitoring uh, patient uh, reports, that communication is actually improved. And importantly, there's also evidence showing that if you ask people how they are, you bring in measures earlier, you support them more. If you support people more, it's a no-brainer, you're going to improve outcomes. And as a team, we've done a lot of work, not only looking at how technology can enable the measurement of patient reported outcomes, we've looked at how patient reported outcomes can be used within clinical consultations. And we've done most of our work within the field of cancer care. So we've worked with partners like NHS Lanarkshire and other health services to look at how do clinicians use this patient report within their day-to-day -day care delivery to enable enhanced cl clinical decision making. We've done it in patients with lung cancer, patients with melanoma, uh, patients with colorectal cancer, and we've also conducted large um, systematic reviews. So the, the lower paper there actually shows a, a study that we published. It was 2014, it was a meta-analysis of the value of the routine use of patient reported outcome measures within clinical practice. And we reviewed a systematic review of controlled trials and started to generate the evidence base of what this patient report can do in terms of processes of care, health outcomes and cost. And a lot of the work that we've done is really looked at if you put a patient reported outcome measure on a mobile phone, on a tablet, on a web page, how does that enhance their applicability um, and their benefits within routine clinical care? So once again, it enables that patient own, own report, which is gold standard. Um, it increases timely access to care because you've, what you've got is a real-time conveyance of that information. Basically, the patient can complete a patient reported outcome measure and literally within minutes that information can be sent to the most appropriate person within the appropriate setting and action can be taken if required. 
It can make resources more broadly available, so we know that our workforce is shrinking, we've got more and more people to care for. So for example, when you look at electronic measurement, it means that you may be able to have one staff member um, overlooking or remotely monitoring a, a larger number of, of people within their caseload. And importantly, it can have a role in reducing um, inequalities. So inequalities in terms of uh, geographical location. So if you live in rural areas, there's a lot of evidence showing that inequalities can grow. But by putting patient reported outcomes on technological uh, platforms, we can reduce these inequalities. There's evidence showing reductions in unscheduled care. So once again, cost savings to large, large organisations like the NHS. And when we looked at the vision of Connected Health, it's about how these systems can triage and direct care provision. So if you measure patient's report, you develop some algorithms, you can actually direct that information to the right person at the right time and importantly at the right setting. So stop this kind of matrix, spaghetti matrix of people accessing multiple services until they actually get to the right person that they need to see. And as with paper versions, it prompts clinicians to intensify symptom management, improve symptom control, importantly enhances quality of life, enhances communication, patient satisfaction, well-being. And more and more what we're finding is that most patients are able to self-report via the web and mo mobile devices even close to the end of life. When I present about technology, patient reported outcome measures, I always get asked these questions about frailty and older people, but our experience is that with the right training, and the right user co-design methodology and that you develop very simple technologies, people can engage and they can self-report. It's about that system that surrounds the technology in terms of how it's applied and also the training. And this is a, a fairly recent paper um, published by Ethan Bash and his team in the States. And this was a single site randomised controlled trial. And what it showed for the first time was that web-based collection of patient reported outcome measures during chemotherapy treatment with automated for alerts for clinicians actually um, translated into a survival benefit. This was the first study of its kind to start showing survival benefit in this real-time remote monitoring of symptoms and response to that patient-generated data. So I know it's only a single site study, but it starts to show the real benefits um, of measuring the patient self-report and embedding it within the clinical decision-making arena. And now we know it's been very topical today, the whole concept of real-world evidence, particularly within pharma. Do the medicines do what they say they're going to do outside the clinical trials? And patient-reported outcomes um, play a large role within that real-world evidence agenda in addition to evidence, traditional evidence from electronic health records, um, from, from registries, but also new types of data that we can bring in from all parts of our world, from our data on shopping preferences, data from our wearables, data from the apps. And right now we're still looking at how we can embed these very heterogeneous and different data sets and combine them together to really start to generate more of that picture of what the citizen-generated world looks like. And for us and for the work that we do, yes, precision medicine and the medicines are important, but we also need precision care. And this real world evidence agenda really gives us the opportunity to do that, to be really precise to the individual based on where they are in the world and their outcomes and what they're doing. And just moving on to the work that we've been involved in for well over a decade, um, our system's called the Advanced Symptom Management System. And it's a mobile phone based remote um, monitoring patient reported outcome system. It is one of the most evolved and evaluated mobile health systems in cancer care. So um, as we've gone along, we have evaluated in terms of patient outcomes, in terms of feasibility and acceptability in a number of different cancer patient populations. It's evidence-based in terms of the PROMs that we embed in the system, the clinical algorithms that we deploy, and the self-care advice that we, we give back on our system. And I'll explain a wee bit more about that in a, in a couple of slides on. But importantly, it's been conducted and developed in conjunction with the experts, so people with cancer and the clinicians caring for them. And we've been very aware of accessibility, things like health literacy. So we've made the system as simple as possible. And we have used a very rigorous framework for intervention development. So we've gone from prototypes, feasibility, acceptability, right up to a large-scale European randomised control trial that we're currently conducting, which is called eSmart. And I'll talk a wee bit more about that. 
So we work with our soft pa software partners, Docable, who are based in the southeast of England, to develop our system. Um, and our system has three modules, but combined it also produces a, an overall solution. So we have the first, what we call as module one, and that's where it's simply monitoring patient reported outcome measures. So via app or via a mobile device, patients can complete patient reported outcome measures on a mobile phone. Um, in our chemotherapy study, our large European study, they do it every day. But in other populations, they may do it every few days or every week. It's based on the populations that we look at. So our first module is monitoring, and it can do that observational data collection relatively easily, and we've demonstrated it in a number of populations. Our module two is where we've got the real-time monitoring of PROMS, but when we start to embed self-care, it's about where you try to empower the citizen to become more involved in their own care delivery and how they can manage their own symptoms and side effects. So you'd have your remote monitoring, and then you would have self-care coming back on the app or on the mobile phone and how they can help themselves. And then module three is when you combine the monitoring the self-care advice, and you start to generate real-time alerts to clinicians at the clinical sites. So, for example, in our chemotherapy study, for us, a red alert would be an indication of neutropenic sepsis, high temperature, flu-like symptoms, new and severe pains. And we develop all our algorithms for the, ge the generation of alerts, looking at clinical guidelines, working with experts and working with patients. And these alerts are generated. Um, a clinician then gets an alert in the hospital. They log on to a secure web page. And literally within the minutes of that patient completing that patient reported outcome measure, the clinician can see what's happening. And importantly, they can respond in real time. So we actually have a whole solution, but where various levels and modules can be offered within that solution that, that, that we offered just now. We've also got a a capability for the collection of PROMS data, for example, in cancer follow-up. So within our European trial, patients use our system during chemotherapy treatment, but for a year post-treatment, they're also collecting outcome data at three monthly time points. And that's very easily, it's via a web, mail link, a web link um, set, sent via an email. They click on the web link and they complete the PROMS um, online. So we've also got the functionality for that follow-up um, if required. So as I say, and, and just here I'm describing our, our chemotherapy system, we also develop PROMS. So we developed the CTAC, so the, the chemotherapy toxicity assessment questionnaire. And this was in response that when we looked at the PROMS that were out there, we saw that they often asked people to rate their symptoms over a week or over a month. But for our system and for daily remote monitoring, we wanted to develop a PROM that would measure it every day. So we went through all the necessary steps to develop the CTAC and we did reliability and validity testing. And we've just actually recently published this paper in the European Journal of Oncology and Nursing, showing how we have developed, European Journal of Cancer Care, sorry, showing how we've developed this daily PROM for daily symptom monitoring over time. This is another paper from our eSmart trial showing how we developed the evidence base for our system. So how we looked at systematic reviews, how we had expert input and consensus, and how we made sure that our system had close alignment with existing reporting systems within the various countries. So for example, in the UK, how could we make sure it had alignment with the Yukon system of toxicity reporting as well? I think that's a duplicate slide. Um, and importantly, as George said, it's not just about the technology. Uh, we provide support um, in the implementation of the systems within the different clinical areas. So as part of eSmart and with our partners, uh, we develop training videos, we develop booklets, um, PowerPoint presentations, and importantly, we made sure we had 24-7 technical reporting and response services. So if any of the sites had problems, they could report and we could manage any technical problems. So just moving on to the eSmart study, it's very much a collaborative effort. It's a group effort that has really worked um, on one of the, the unique studies of this type on going across Europe at this moment in time. So the lead consortium is University of Strathclyde, but we have partners in University of Surrey, Dundee, University of California, San Francisco, Medical University of Vienna, NHS 24, King's College London, University of Athens, University of Dublin, Inland Debt Hospital Trust in Norway. Importantly, we've got the European Cancer Patient Coalition as partners and our SME uh, Dockable. So we received 6 million euros from EU FP7 funding. 
And what the eSmart trial is a randomised control trial of remote patient monitoring of patient reported outcome measures in Europe. So what we're remotely monitoring every day are chemotherapy, is chemotherapy toxicity. Um, we've just finished recruitment and we've recru recruited over 840 patients across five countries in Europe. Um, and we expect the results of the study to be available in July 2019. So we're just in the final months of the study and it hopefully we'll publish them shortly. We've published the protocol within the BMJ, um, which gives you a detailed picture of um, the study, the protocol and how we, what we followed. Um, and this is just an overview of how we've uh, tested our technology. We did some feasibility testing to embed the system within the different uh, countries within Europe. Um, we originally aimed to recruit 1,100 patients, but so far, um, from looking at our attrition rate, that is very small. Um, so it looks like we will hopefully have a fully powered trial, but obviously we're in the stages of, of determining that. Half of the group went into the intervention group, half went into the control group, and then, as I say, both groups were followed up for a year. So in terms of cancer care, remote monitoring of PROMs, and impact on outcomes, this is one of the largest studies of its type ever to be conducted. Our primary outcome is symptom burden, um, and we've also got a number of secondary outcomes, so looking at health-related quality of life, supportive care needs, anxiety, self-efficacy, are people more empowered to care for themselves? We're interested in work limitations. Does it mean that people get back to work quicker or not? And we're doing a very strong cost-benefit um, component to the study, and that's led by King, King's College London. And we're also looking at the implementation piece. So we're currently interviewing uh, patients and clinicians across the different sites to see how the system is embedded across different countries in Europe and across very, very different health systems. One of the work packages of eSmart is looking at big data and predictive risk modelling, and this is really led by our colleagues in the U Univer University of California, San Francisco, and the University of Surrey. And ideally, what we want to do is use big data from our study and from previous studies to apply machine learning and neural networks to actually start to identify in advance what symptoms people are likely to experience. So if you can identify toxicities that an individual is likely to experience, you can target them, you can maybe prevent them, but you can minimise them and have a much more anticipatory and preventative model of cancer care delivery. And these are recent papers that we've published in Nature Scientific Reports and PLUS One, showing how really this work is really leading within the space of cancer symptoms, and machine learning and predictive risk modelling. And importantly, we're looking at the clinical utility of these predictive risk models. So yes, it's a bit like the technology. Can we develop the technology? But what does it mean in the real world? What do patients think of these predictions? What do professionals think of these predictions? How will they use them within practice, in practice? Do they find it helpful and would they use it? And we've conducted a number of focus groups across all the countries that we've embedded the technology in. And we're getting really interesting information back about how people would use it, what they would want to use it for. And once again, we've got this real world applicability in the technologies that we develop to make sure they can be used and make that impact. And really, we've, so our most of all system is chemotherapy. We've done that within the eSmart trial, but we've also done various levels of testing and development in other populations. We've done two phases in palliative care. We've just finished a feasibility study funded by the British Lung Foundation, looking at remote monitoring in mesothelioma. We've done the first phase in radiotherapy toxicity management, the first phase in looking at multimorbidity. Chemotherapy is our most evolved system. We've got early work going on in the space of dementia, and we've got early work going on in the space of post-operative care. And now we have lots of interest within this real world evidence piece because we have been collecting and working with this PROMS data for a long time. So we're really familiar with it and familiar with how you can embed it within clinical practice. And our work has scaled across Europe. Um, in Cancer Care Ontario, they're using our, our eSmart system at present. And we've previously done work in Australia. So it's kind of shown the reach of the research that we've done and the different health systems that have used it and embedded it and importantly tested it. And moving on, what we're really looking at is with the big data that we generate from these systems. So we have daily symptom data from people over a number of months. Not many people have that information. And we're really moving on looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
bringing in more consumer and wearable data and thinking about how we can become much more intelligent and precise within the care agenda um, and really moving that forward and that's where we're, we're going. Um, do I have time to show this video? Yes. So this is a, a video. It's, it's from it's guys uh, in London that are using our system. And it's a short testimony by people who have used our system and also professionals and how they've found using our system within direct clinical care. So the eSmart study is a European randomised controlled trial in five countries across Europe of our mobile phone-based remote patient monitoring system to support patients with cancer during a the chemotherapy treatment. Within cancer care, um, what's important is to develop technologies that support people when they're at home. Just now the majority of care is delivered as an outpatient in hospital and people have to go home and manage the symptoms and side effects on their own. eSmart is a patient-centred cancer care system. The patient's at the heart of it, they drive it, they drive the responses. It's a series of algorithms um, that form into a questionnaire that the patients uh, complete on a daily basis that then will trigger alerts based on the patient's answer to those questions. It's quite a nice little tool that obviously people can use just from their phones so and from their out and about, they're not tied to being anywhere in particular. Traditionally, the acute oncology service of nurses take phone calls from patients and report their symptoms. The way that eSmart just makes that a bit better is that patients don't have to decide or work out when they feel unwell. Katie's brilliant. She showed me how to do it and I've never had a problem with it and she comes and sees me on the ward when I'm doing my chemo. The biggest benefit for me was just I felt as if me recording my symptoms was actually going to help other people. That was a huge thing for me, it really was. But the good thing about it is that it's interactive, so if, there's, if you're outside you know, the sort of envelope of normality, then additional information will be presented to you immediately. And this is a huge reassurance. I do it first thing in the morning, take my temperature, and then I fill in the questionnaires on there and tell them how I'm feeling and then if there's a problem, the hospital calls me. The minute I stopped it, I completely forgot to take my temperature or do anything. So it really helped me to do that and gave me a bit more of a focus about recording what pills I'd taken and all that kind of thing. But trivial things are dealt with within the programme and so you're not having to go to the team for help and also they are not being bothered by you. <laughs> I think it was seven of my chemos I had it for. I think all patients really should have it. The difference between ringing up, maybe speaking to the person immediately, maybe having to leave a message, and using the phone, and having the phone tell you somebody will ring you in half an hour, and somebody ringing you in half an hour, is absolutely huge. It helps you to feel that the world's on your side. You've got a nice, recipient interested in you every morning. So as I say, it's been very much a collaborative effort. These are all the partners um, within the eSmart consortium leading our work across Europe. Um, and just thank you for your time and happy to take questions now or in the days to come. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roma. I think that was excellent. Sorry we didn't have the sound in the last bit, but as we said, the links will be sent to you of all the presentations and you will be able to ask questions directly to George and to Roma. But I'm just wondering if there's any questions just now in the room or online. Uh, now, for those online, uh, you will have a tab, uh, slido.com, that you can click on and uh, you'll be able to ask questions through that. But um, I think we've got some interested parties in the room too, so we'll start there. Uh, Tracy's hand was up. <laughs> so, uh, look, this is fantastic stuff, Roma. And I think you talked about, I mean, it, what I think for me is the, the practicality of how much of this has been done in day-to-day -day use in the, NA, in the NHS or, or in Europe. I mean, I think we've shown a lot of the clinical trial side, but it's how do we translate that into everyday use? It's just really, is there any anecdotal or evidence that you can demonstrate about areas that are using it on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I know in Scotland we've the Cancer uh, Medicines Outcome Challenge, and that was really looking at how any um, EPROM system can collect um, data 
obviously within the sort of cancer care sphere. So I know that that's ongoing. And across the world, there are a number of different um, opportunities. So I know that in the Nordic countries, in Finland and that, they're starting to try to embed routine collection of PROMS data um, within sort of clinical practice. So as there's much more interest, I'm actually seeing it popping up in lots of different countries. Um, but from my experience, Yes, the technology is important, but it's the service and the wraparound that is extremely important in making sure that it actually works and it delivers on the outcomes that you anticipate it will do. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, George, because you were part of the cancer outcomes. Yes, um, it's actually getting a service model that can adopt into day-to-day -day practice. You're absolutely right. And, and the challenge is finding the hearts and minds of the people and winning them, and winning them over. But we've been really quite successful with Macmillan uh, Cancer Care, which is one of the largest uh, cancer charities in the UK. We're finding that um, people are taking up the services that that vo um, voluntary organisation offers too late to really benefit from them. And they're looking to see how they can link patient reported outcome data in a way that they can actually target those services towards the people who really need it at the time they need it. So it's going to be much more of a pool from service users, I think, than push from the system. But that doesn't mean we should be complacent and give up. Uh, I think that every time we have conversations, I think, Roman, it would be fair to say, people are more receptive now to the fact that Absolutely. the world is changing and moving forward, and that we really need to be focusing on outputs, uh, sorry, on outcomes, not inputs and uh, 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 outputs. Um, and that will make the world a much better place for us because that's what's important to you as an individual. Yeah. But it's not what was important to me as a GP for 40 years. Um, we were treating the blood test. We were treating the, the X-ray result. We weren't actually asking the patient what was important to them. Just going to follow on from that, I'm just thinking about how you... How you bring the clinical mindset with you um, on, on, this, on this kind of road of change where the clinicians have not had to engage in this and how you make them feel that this isn't about monitoring them but actually about, about delivering the best care and outcomes for patients? So, I mean, I think there's a few things. So, obviously, as you generate more evidence, the, per the persuasion becomes less because you're now starting to generate evidence about how it improves supportive care symptom outcomes, reduces inappropriate service use. As I say, we've now got studies showing demonstrating improvements in survival. So you can use the, the evidence base, but part of it is engaging with the clinicians, demonstrating, with the val demonstrating the value, understanding their concerns and alleviating their concerns. Um, because sometimes it could be that there's a fear of it replacing face-to-face -face care. That's never been the intention, and it's highlighting how it can complement, it can enhance care. It can allow them to see the patients that need to be prioritised. And the ones that are fine at home, getting on with their lives, you can leave them alone. And when you look at um, you know, studies of the patient experience, you know, people talk about wanting to get back to normality and getting back to normal life. So leave them to get on with it, but know that when they need help, they can actually access it. So part of it is creating the bigger picture and, and letting them see that vision and articulating it. Um, and in my experience, if you work with them, you address their concerns. Um, even when you embed it within practice, you have to work with the clinical systems and understand how is it going to embed, what is it going to disrupt, and how can you help them manage it within their, their, their current systems. So there's a whole wraparound that goes with that, but that's kind of how we have managed it in the past and, and now. Yeah. I mean, but if you think about it this way, if you can add citizen-generated data, whatever that is, into the the, the conventional data sets that clinicians are used to looking at. We all know that the more information that you have about someone, the easier it is to make an informed and safe decision on how you move forward. There is no clinician who's saying, actually, I want less information to make those decisions. So once clinicians understand that this is supportive, it's not monitoring, it's not a big stick, it's genuinely there to help, and then if you look at it from the patient's point of view, we want people to get on with their day-to-day -day lives. And as Roma mm -hmm. says, if people can avoid going to the hospital clinic to walk in the door for the three minutes to actually say, I'm fine, thank you very much. 
but you know that on the week running up to that appointment, the level of anxiety increases. Uh, and it actually serves to remind them that they either are or have been unwell. That is not helpful if that appointment is not necessary. And therefore, using patient-reported outcomes and backing that up with some hard data that's generated by the citizen themselves can allow you to put in place a much more sensitive and sensible way of managing illness into the medium and long term. So uh, I think we'll now uh, go over to our colleagues in Edinburgh. So thank you very much, uh, George and Roma. Um, I hope you're maybe going to stay for this part too, are you? And so we're about to go over uh, to hear from Jeff Huggins and from Dr. Alistair Han. And uh, we can see them now. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, and if you would like to start your presentation. I think uh, we're all set to go here. Hi, um, yeah. Jeff Perkins. Alistair Han. Okay, you should have the presentation loaded up uh, as a separate screen. Can I just check you've got the title page? There we go. Yeah. Okay, um, so we've got 15 or so slides, we're going to talk about where we've got to in the in the process. I'm going to start with the background to the work we're doing being the, sorry, has that moved on? Okay. So the the background to the work that we're doing come from, comes from Scotland's Digital Health and Care Strategy published last year, um, published on the 25th of April effectively committed the Scottish Government and the NHS in Scotland to developing a digital platform to achieve three broad aims. Clinical data at the point of care, um, whether that's clinician to patient or patient self-service. Um, a common architecture that allows for innovation so that new products as they develop can be deployed across the system and that the current barriers to implementation are addressed and the ability to work with data at scale for the purposes of research and quality. We, we were established as an organization within NHS NES during last summer, and we've been building this, the organization as an organization, but also creating the, the, the model of how we want to work and what we want to achieve um, across the autumn of last year. Um, and in terms of where we are, the, the slide which um, I'm now showing, shows the, the core building blocks of how we're thinking about the process. So the idea of um, holding a, a single version of the data in a clinical data repository, um, having authentication processes, the processes by which either clinicians or staff can have access to that data, um, the capability to index that data against individual patients or citizens, and, and then I guess a group of things that we've put in a service directory, but those things that you might only want to do once, like all the places where you can attend a GP. You know, the idea that in that case where you've got effectively a data place, a database of, of a particular type of thing, which can then become part of many products, um, which you don't create within each product. Across the autumn, we've gone through the process of beginning to build out and understand how we might achieve these. So we have the idea, and I'm adding the, the words to the slide now, of the clinical data repository being the EtherSys data repository, using open air data archetypes, um, which uh, Alistair will say a bit more about. Um, taking the work that we've been doing through Office 365 in Azure to give us authentication through Azure Active Directories, um, we're working through the process of citizen authentication with the Scottish Government and the Digital Identity Scotland work. Um, we've got the work to replace CHI, the indexing system, um, which, which is underway, but also then the, the further work that we're doing with eHealth Leads and others to actually begin to develop those service directories. So that gives us a, the core architecture, the core understanding of what the platform would consist in, which is the work that we did. To the um, to the end of last year, and we've begun to build out. So, Alistair's going to say a bit more <coughs> now about the open air and, and the the process. So, you, 
Um, one of the important things about using the open air standard for storing the clinical data is it offers opportunities to make sure data are reused across different contexts. Um, there's a lot of talk about interoperability of systems and using standards like HL7 and FHIR to get data in and out of them. But if they don't store the data using the same models, often um, knowledge and information is lost when it's transferred between those places because it isn't possible to represent the data the same way in two different locations. So if it's migrating from one supplier to another, then that's not available. Now, I'm going to talk through the open air standard and explain why that's different, because it's, it's really important to making sure that we, we do have data that's portable, but also that we don't keep asking citizens the same questions again and again in care contexts. So the core of open air, there's a reference model. This is essentially a, um, a model in terms of demographics and how things work and how the system works, which only IT people and health informaticians need to worry about. But in the next layer of the system, there are clinical archetypes. So the clinical archetypes are data points that you um, only define once, such as a blood pressure, a particular labs result, um, something like blood glucose. And these are defined once. And then when you actually do things such as creating templates, those templates refer back to those archetypes. So you can have arch templates in different contexts, um, such as a discharge summary or, um, or, or, or some, some other kind of formal way of collecting data. But the way it's collecting data is always going back to those original data archetypes. And it's only at the very end that you actually produce code and things from those in, in order to produce your, your interface or your, or your web page or however you're capturing the data. And just to go back to why this is important, Essentially, what this means is you can run queries against those archetypes um, using something that's called archetype query language. So it's a language a bit like SQL, but it enables you to run a query across all data that have been captured using the open air system rather than just those data that were captured um, um, in that particular form. And it's not that people will necessarily be running those queries themselves, but it enables you to create applications that give you a view across the whole record and not just that, that individual results. Um, now, something we're doing at, um, uh, so it's a lot of latency on the slides. Um, so something we're doing at, um, at NDS is to go for a different approach to how you build software. So we'll all we'll be familiar with quite a traditional way of um, the public sector developing software where there are expensive um, procurement exercises and, um, and, and and what happens is you produce a telephone book of requirements and then that's eventually um, made available um, to suppliers and then the software gets delivered and it might not be what's wanted, but you kind of stuck with it for 10 years other than expensive change requests. But what we're looking to do is actually try and deliver the platform as a series of products that each of which delivers some value in terms of improving care, but also we learn from them at each stage. So I like to illustrate it with this sort of diagram here of, the, of, of how you can build a car. Now, you can build a car in a series of steps and start with just a wheel and then the chassis and then the body and then the steering wheel, but actually that isn't a, um, that isn't a useful until the very final step. Whereas actually, if you look at the bottom example, well, if we're trying to solve the problem of getting from A to B, so let's start with a skateboard and the skateboard's a bit unstable so you put on steering and then later on you want to put on brakes so you can slow down you produce a bike but at every stage you've got something usable and, and that's how we're thinking about building up the platform that actually that the platform is ultimately about sharing data across health and social care and across the nation of scotland in a unified way and that's a great place to get to but actually what's the smallest bit of information we can share across health and social care in scotland and and across um across the nation and demonstrate that with that one bit of data and then we can start adding to that and building outwards and that first bit of data we're sharing is something called um, a respect document so the respect process is a process where citizens can communicate how they wish to be treated in the event of an emergency if they're not able to communicate it themselves so perhaps they're unconscious and the reason for this is that perhaps they um, don't wish to receive treatment or they wish to um, uh, die at home or in a hospice, but also maybe that actually they want to have every type of treatment available, even if it's quite uncomfortable or painful. And it's, it's an important change because it's a dialogue between the patient and, and their care staff, and they're really take, involved in the decision because they're able to do it earlier on. Now, the initial implementation of this that's been used by clinicians has been the 
paper form. So it's a purple form that can be filled in. And we've been working with the health board who've rolled these out as an initial way of doing things. But inevitably, there are limitations of doing this in a um, in a paper manner that you need this to be available at a at the point of an emergency. So if someone's just arrived in A&E and a paper form isn't much use, or you might need to bring it up in a document management system or at someone's home and um, is it going to be available whereas actually if there's an electronic copy you can be confident that everyone has the latest version of the document but also and um, it needs to be possible for people in different care contexts to update the com document and um, and to access it too because it's not just something produced by gps which is how the current emergency care summary works here are just some screenshots from that application um just one Okay, uh, so in, in terms of um, the information that gets um, captured in there, and um, it looks a bit different to, I guess, typical um, clinical applications. We're working with um, uh, primary care, secondary care, palliative care at the moment in terms of getting feedback on the design in terms of, from the people who are implementing this and they're trying out the different prototypes as we as we evolve this. And, um, and there'll be effectively a series of this of, of versions of this application delivered to you. Um, so citizens in terms of initially just available in primary care, but then available to secondary care, then available in primary care too. How do we roll it out to the ambulance service? How do we get it in front of citizens? But actually each of those is an important step of getting that care record shared across different care contexts, and then also citizens be able to access it and ultimately be able to change things in it. So this screenshot shows um, um, the emergency contact number. So actually if they need to update their friend's telephone number, citizens can do that themselves rather than having to ask a GP to update their friend's telephone number on there or, or having to indeed produce a whole new paper form just to make a small amendment to it. So it's really the, the benefits of this electronic record that's shared across citizens and care. So I touched on the idea of that roadmap. Um, so the, the idea is that initially we just um, have built quite a simple version of it that's only accessible through, through our website, but then the next thing is integrating with the Fourth Valley um, GP systems and the portal that they use in acute care, and also providing them with a, um, an, an API, an endpoint, where they, which they can query to find out if a form exists for a particular patient. Then after that, we move on to make it available for the ambulance service, out of hours GPs, and, and then getting onto the citizen website as well, as uh, sorry, citizen access as well, which um, hinges on the citizen authentication that Jeff was talking about earlier. Um, so Jeff, do you want to talk about the kind of how this fits in our overall roadmap and timeline? Yeah, so that, that gives the sort of example about how we're actually addressing this with, with the first product. And the intention is that we'll have that product available as we get into end of April, beginning of May. So that it's, 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 it's important for us to actually be doing things which become being used within the system so that we can then take the learning forward. I'm just going to give you an idea of the work that we're doing across 2019 um, through a series of slides, you know, including that work, but also linking in the other work to give an, a, a, a wider idea of the other things that we're doing to take the project forward. So we, we have, as Alice just talked about, we have the, the particular respect piece of work, which you know, we would expect to have taken into deployment in quarter two of the year. But then as we then work through the year, um, beginning to extend that to other boards on, on the basis that um, having connected ourselves to the Fourth Valley system, um, we can then connect to other healthcare systems within Scotland and effectively support the same product across those different health boards. And, and that's a, an interesting innovation for us in that we can do thing, things at the moment with portals, but effectively now we would, have, we, would have, we, we would be supporting the same product in other places in Scotland. The, the second thing with the respect work is then to begin to extend it out. So taking the work that we've done with respect and using the core data, enhancing that to provide future versions of KISS and ECS um, that are able to support that as well. We've got then the, the line on citizen facing. So we're in the process this month of doing the scoping work um, and then um, looking t and, and we're doing conversations with NHS Digital and other about how we might take that work forward with the expectation that by the time we get into quarter three of the year, that we can begin to do some of the work about rolling that out into practice. Um, and looking at, at appointments within that. The, the bit that you've had with if the slides, which I'm seeing or the version that you're seeing, you've seen a piece of um, a set of um, items around, thank you, around innovation projects. So this is a particular piece of work that we're doing with Greater Glasgow and 
Hyde Health Board to join our system to their system effectively so that we can support a series of innovation product projects which have been funded by UK or other money around COPD and dermatology, um, with those effectively being situated on the platform, um, supporting the, create the, the data going into the CDR, but again, using that as a model to build out the CDR. And we would expect also to then to be able to deploy those products into other health boards. Um, so we're working through that. We've given the commitment to Glasgow to be connected to them um, effectively by the end of April, and we're working through the IG and security uh, and processes to enable us to do that. And that, that gives us learning as to how to take that forward. We've got a line on the, um, on the page also in respect of research. So we were successful in bidding for one of the Health Data Research UK sprint bids, which is a piece of work around data mapping um, and being able to produce a graph version of the data assets that we have within Scotland for health and care, but also then using that to interrogate those assets and ideally to be able to pull data from them for future products. I've, I've included a line there on genomics for the work that we're doing to bring together the genomic data, which is currently held across four sites in a structured way, which also enables us to take it into clinical care and research care and, and further work around that. And the you know the overall slide sort of gives you the it gives you the particular lines, but also the the platform work at the top, which is what we covered at the beginning and where we are with that work, but also the process that we're working through at the bottom in respect of cloud hosting. So we went out to market about um, two weeks ago now, and advertised effectively for cloud provision to support the platform. The the, the piece of work that we're doing in parallel with the Glasgow work is effectively to locate the CDR and the other. Um, material onto the cloud so that it, it effectively you know, is able to run as enterprise architecture um, to support mobile and to support integrations across all Scotland's boards over time. So that's probably about 60% of the work that we're doing this year, but to give a sense as to how we're building it out through projects that we're running ourselves, such as the ACP, projects that we're bringing from the innovation space, some of the broader data sets coming from things like genomics or imaging or things like that potentially, but also looking at, a, at across patient facing and research agendas. So that's pretty much. Yep. Yep. That's us. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff and Alistair. Um, if I can go back to a conversation that we had a while ago, it was around um, wanting industry to be able to input to you as to what they would be looking for from Scotland. Um, as a research hub and I'm wondering if you've any thoughts about how we should uh, take that forward. Right now you've got about 40 to 50 people from pharma um, dialing in to, to this so you've got a good platform and I'm just wondering if you've any thoughts about how we should engage with you uh, to make sure that what you're, you're building will be fit for purpose for the research that we can bring to Scotland. So, so maybe a, a couple of things on that. So one of the things that we're doing at the moment is working across the main research centres in Scotland to talk about this idea of digital innovation hubs. Uh, and it's the idea that the, the platform brings greater data capability, but we then need to match that with um, data scientists, with academic clinicians, with um, jobbing clinicians to then work through the process of developing new products and new services that can be deployed in Scotland and elsewhere, as well as supporting some of the more hardcore research around pharmacology or data products. So we think that work will take place within locations. So one of our part of our objective is using the platform to be the basis for that work to, to take place and, and the foundation on which um, data partners, industry partners are able to operate. I guess it means for us some of the questions that we have are you know, what are the types of interactions that um, industry would need? You know, how would it need to be able to consume and link to the data that is there? But how can we then build the appropriate commercial governance and um, other models about how we actually do business together in that space? Now, we anticipate that'll probably sit with others. You know, we, we're effectively the supplier of infrastructure and some product within this. But you know, that sort of how you are able to pull together deals 
and what the particular asks of industry in that space would be. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, do we have any questions um, across the the room? Because. Because one of the things I'd like to ask uh, just now, while folk are thinking about it, is you, I'm delighted that you've shown us a time frame for 2019. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about when the, basically just like the primary care and the secondary care platforms will be able to connect and, and speak to one another. So, we're, we're, we've been doing some work with primary care around the reprovisioning of GPIT systems, and, you know, and that work is going ahead, but with the objective of, as these other larger historical systems are looked at and reviewed, that increasingly they're building in similar approaches to authentication, similar approaches to how we store and manage data, but also looking to move data away from proprietary solo, um, silos, so that you know, the, the data is it, 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 it is better integrated. I, I guess we do see this as um, both iterative and cumulative, but also with the potential to look at some of the larger data stores like genomics uh, and bringing them in. And, and I, I guess what we're what, what what we I think we anticipate is that we probably can accelerate the growth of clinical data within the system with the appropriate um, methodologies and, and, and platform in that. You know, once data becomes reusable uh, and becomes something which gives feedback to clinicians and they, they can see the value of the um, the behavioral components, the desire to actually create the data will increase. Because mm -hmm. at the moment it feels often that the data that you're producing is simply going into PDFs and being st stored in Docman, whereas if the data becomes you know, is seen as having a clinical and care value, um, we, we, we think that'll be um, joined together. It, you know, your question is, you know, when, when have we got somewhere far enough along the um, the timeline for this to be something worth engaging with. It, it maybe reverse that a bit in that this will move faster than more people who um, engage with it and you know, push it to resolve problems and that we, we see this as largely moving forward by solving a series of problems as we go. So if we get really good um, challenges um, asks, you know, whether through the, the work at the Queen Elizabeth or the ERI in Edinburgh or the Universities of Glasgow or Edinburgh or Aberdeen. Those would be the things which accelerate the process that we're working with here. Okay, thank you. I, I've got a question in the room from uh, Fiona from Jane uh, Hi, Jeff. I'm, I'm just wondering about some of the challenges. We, we can't hear the audience, just ah, so you here, know. Hold on, you might know. You might know. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Um, Can you hear now? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Ju I'm just yeah. wondering about one of the challenges that industry faces is the standardisation of data across Scotland. So some of the systems that are in place in the standard, there's not standardisation of the collection and how you will address that. I'll, I'll ask Alistair to say a bit more, but that really goes back to the, you know, the data archetyping and putting the work in at the beginning, understanding that there's value in that. But... Yes, yeah, so I think the... Um... I think the, the open air archetypes gives a great opportunity to make sure that if you've got, even if two different discharge summaries are being used, for example, that they, they're they talking about the same concepts and, and also the, the models enable a lot of granularity, but also they do offer opportunities for better quality in terms of understanding data that are captured. So if it's a blood pressure measurement, understanding what position that um, the patient is in when the blood pressure has been captured and what methods being used to do it. So, there's a, I think, I think both well, using the standards will enable us to both to improve the um, consistency of data being captured and avoid a lot of matching across things, but also improve the quality of data capture in terms of how that happens. And, and, and thirdly, um, I think this will also enable um, greater consistency of actually just how, what data are captured and how, because, because we're providing things at a national level. Um, I think it would be probably greater tendency for boards to inherit and, and, and borrow and extend from, from existing things that are available in the platform. So rather than them implementing their own discharge summary and track care and someone does, does a discharge summary and track care, it's a case of, well, there's a discharge summary available on the digital yeah. platform and that's, that's already available. Maybe they need to extend it a little bit or not, but there'll be just more consistency and approach in terms of how people capture data and, and, and that ties into the um, realistic medicine agenda as well in terms of consistency. 
The, the other thing I think we're, which we're seeing is we're seeing a number of asks around what are described as national systems for something, for you know labs or ophthalmology or something or something or something. And you know historically those would have been produced as separate data sets um, with maybe some degree of linkage with the other data sets. And you know as as people are now talking to us about how they might do those and manage those over time, it enables us to make some of the connections with open air, but also to not by authentication again and again, not by indexing again and again, you know, and be able to c cascade information which is generic information into them, like you know, personal, you know, personal data or data which is already available. So I think there'll be a natural process of standardisation as you know, it, it exercises a degree of gravity on other things which are happening within the system. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I've got a question from Marion from Novartis. Hi guys, um, you might not be able to answer this question from comments you made earlier, but we know the Scottish Government are keen for the uh, pharma industry to take advantage of what you guys in the room and yourselves are working on at the moment. But there doesn't seem to be a platform, it seems to be siloed at the moment. So in your opinion, what is the best way to drive this forward so that pharma can come together and support you with the expertise that they have, but also take advantage of what you are developing? So, so I think there's probably three three components to that, maybe four components to that, which are all quite interesting. So I, I think um, you know, my, my understanding is the Scottish Government is certainly very positive about our relationship with pharma and the ability to create knowledge and value, but still sometimes struggles in actually working out how it will articulate that. So I think that component needs to be worked through to entirely understand what the arrangements are in terms of public benefit, public value. And, and there's work on, on, on that. So I think that's that's one component of it. In in terms of a second component, I think relates to the the structure and the nature of the engagement. So whether that's directly with the platform or through an intermediary platform, you know, through a research environment that might be overlap with the platform. And I think that's one of the areas which we'll begin to become, we'll work, we will be working through as part of the work to understand digital innovation hubs and things like that. So exactly what the architecture and, 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 and structure is. Um, I think collectively we need to become um, better collaborators with industry. We need a better front door for how that's managed. Now, we don't think that's something that we ourselves will do directly. We think that's more of a, that's a, a different function from what we're set up to do, but we think it's really important that it happens so that people get full value out of the platform. So we're certainly agitating and encouraging people to resolve that, that sort of issue. So there's, there's, this is, there's, more, there's three or four components to this. Um, we think that your industry and your colleagues have a role to play in, 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 I guess, in explaining the value that there would be in resolving these issues. And you know, we're happy to work with you on that. That's great, thank you. Graham, I think. Uh, there we are. Hi, um, it was a quick question about ensuring that uh, patient data is kind of kept secure is obviously very important. Um, and I was just wondering how far away are we from using solutions like the blockchain to secure data in an NHS setting, or is that kind of a bit of a pipe dream? But there's, a, I guess, a presumption in that that using blockchain would make it more secure. Um, Alistair, do you want to cover blockchain? <laughs> um, so you, I, you're right that security is critical to this um, in terms of um, you know, we'll be holding a lot of very private data and there's high expectations of how that should be handled. Um, we've been working with the National Cyber Security Centre in terms of making sure that our um, both from an architectural point of view but also in terms of supply chain and supply point of view that we are and can make things as robust as as, as possible, um, and and I think there's an opportunity to up improve the security of um, of things from where they currently stand as, as part of that process. Because we will, um, there's a work alongside the work to be the national digital platform to move to Office 365 and Windows 10 to move into greater levels of of patching against vulnerabilities and not running on insecure vulnerable versions of Windows and things like that. So security is in the middle of what we're doing. Um, blockchain specifically is, is not something we're looking at, that most of the challenges we're looking at uh, can be solved with 
modern other you know, other modern technologies that this have been very long proven and and solve the problems we need to do we haven't encountered anything yet that could only be solved by a blockchain rather than um, blockchain being one of the ways of, of solving it so it's, it's not part of our solution at present okay thank you that's put blockchain in its box uh so uh <laughs> sorry it's <laughs> <laughs> fine with don't think we've got any investment in blockchain. Uh, so, so I think we've uh, we're now just a, a few few minutes. If there's just anything else, oh yeah, yeah, we do. We have another question. Uh, this question is coming from Tracy. So from hi, Pfizer. It's, it's Tracy Bowden here from Pfizer. So obviously we've heard a lot about real world data, and I mean the part of this global showcase is to demonstrate why Scotland basically. And I think what I, we know that other countries are, are doing some of this and we've obviously heard quite a lot from um, Matt Hancock recently and the new Cabinet Secretary of Health in England looking at a lot of data. And I think it's just about what is it Scotland can do, you know, to give itself its USP and what it differs in or how it leads. And I think that's just a question I'd be putting out to anyone in the room really. So, so I think there's a couple of things which are, are, are quite important. We, we, when we had the conversation, probably almost exactly this time last year, with the, the minister, one of the things that we said was, as we looked around this agenda, we saw a lot of people looking at what might be described as the, the edge activity. What's the most advanced thing that we can currently do? Um, you know, what's the, you know, the exciting, the flashy, the inter interesting thing? And, and our take on it was that that was all well and good, and it was fun, and it was interesting, but there were some really dull things that had to be done quite well to enable you to do lots of more, even more exciting things long term. So you need to actually take a step back into the infrastructure and structure it in a way that enables you to do many things. And as you do those many things, it becomes more straightforward rather than more complicated. So, so that, so that, so I think part of this is we've actually sort of taken a really cold hard look at what needs to change to have a system in which you're able to hold, manage and use data, which gives you immense power, rather than something which you have to cobble together again and again, just to keep the lights on. And, and I, so I, I think that's a differentiator in that we're doing that at scale and at a national level. Um, we've got significant political support and we've got a history in healthcare of a fairly consistent report. My, my previous work was on integration, as some of you will know, it was announced in 2011 by the First Minister. It is still one of the first Health Secretary's four top priorities. So we're eight years on, and it is still an item right at the top of the plate. So they've got the out, they take, um, ministers here take a, a big plays and commit to them. So I think, I, th I think that's core to it. Um, we're sitting here in the base building in Edinburgh, um, in one of the top three or two or three centres for computer science in in the world in terms of and with an interest in AI and NLP and all that exciting stuff which is a wee bit further down the track but we're, we're working with the people who are and that's where some of the HDR UK things so we've got the capability to tap into expertise which is simply not available elsewhere and I, and I think beyond that we've got a, a really strong clinical offering you know you're sitting in Glasgow today with the universities of Strathclyde the University of, of Glasgow where you've got um, cl clinical um, clinicians working in teams and on problems who are the successors to the people who found the cures, you know, the cures in past days, which were you know, the world changing game changers. And so there's a history of research about evolution. I think Scotland is really quite the place, place for that. Thanks, Jeff. I think that was a, a great answer. Also, I think uh, maybe uh, George and Roma might want to uh, contribute to that. Yes, I mean, I think that that what you've just heard in the last presentation is, a, is another testimony to the approach we take in Scotland, which is this once, once for Scotland approach. And um, on a personal basis, yesterday uh, I was presenting um, and in discussion with the chief executives of the NHS in Scotland about where uh, the Digital Health and Care Innovation Centre can play in uh, to support them in, in addressing the problems they've got today. And we are a size where you can get all the chief executives across all the health boards in one room at the same time with the senior civil servants from Scottish Government. There's not many healthcare systems that can claim to be able to do that. So if the system wants to coordinate its activities and wants to do something, there are fora 
to allow that to happen. And Jeff and Alistair's programme is a, a, a living example of how we're taking forward a single uh, joint approach as opposed to a fragment, fragmented approach that you see in some larger, more devolved healthcare system. Yeah, I mean, I think just to echo what George said, you've got examples of absolute wonderful day excellence going on. It's just about us joining that up um, within the picture and stopping the fragmentation. But we have a population and we're at a size that we can do that and do it well. Um, so I just resonate with George and what Jeff have just said. Yes. Yeah, there was a past health minister that used to say there was a benefit in the Stalinist central command and control. <laughs> and so I, I think maybe uh, Sam Galbraith has uh, got onto something there uh, a long time ago that actually uh, is of benefit to Scotland and our now 5.3 million population. That I think it is about the average size of an HMO in the States. The difference is that our populations tend not to move around. And so they don't you know, move to another health system when they move job, etc. So I think we have the population, we've got the ill health, unfortunately. And now if we can join these platforms together, then it's certainly going to give us a very rich environment, I think, for basically pharma coming into to work in Scotland. So I think unless anybody's got anything else to, to add, um, we are... We are now at our witching hour. I've got to thank everybody who is online, um, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for taking the time to come virtually to Scotland. And uh, I hope we've managed to whet your appetite. You will have the direct uh, details of everybody that's taken part today. And there will also be a link to the presentations that took place today, uh, which you can then pass on to colleagues who weren't able to, to make it to the event and also to ask questions directly to those who are presenting. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much to the presenters for coming in. I'm delighted that, that uh, the technology of Glasgow and Edinburgh coming together, which uh, is a first in so many ways, um, uh, it has worked. And uh, thank you all very much for coming along. Good night. Thank you.